Dr. Compton, welcome to the podcast. I think a good place for us to start is as somebody that's in your position, what's your overall view on marijuana and cannabis um, right now as it's impacting the country? And then how can we do better moving forward? Well, my job at as the deputy director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, is to support research on all aspects of drug use, drug use disorders, and the harms that they can cause with an eye on what can we do to better prevent harms, prevent the consequences, and help treat people who have addiction to the various substances that so many people in our country use. What we've noticed with cannabis or marijuana, and I'll use those two terms pretty much interchangeably, is that it's become much more prevalent in the U.S. in recent years. We've seen a market increase in the number of people beginning to use this substance and then going on from first using it to develop what many of us would call an addiction or a substance use disorder related to cannabis. And of course, that's very worrisome to a public health official. These are exactly the kind of arms that we worry about. I think a lot of people, um, at least in my generation and the generation before me, they've seen over the years, marijuana is like a less harmful drug compared to other substances like cocaine, heroin, and meth. And now I think we've seen, it seems like that's shifted tremendously with how cannabis and marijuana has changed. Um, do you think that given given what you just mentioned, do you think that marijuana should be taking should be taken as seriously as other dangerous substances? Well, each one of the substances has a different range of difficulties associated with it. For instance, we see the overdose deaths just so frequent with people who use opioids. We do not see overdose deaths associated with cannabis. So that is absolutely a fact that it is not something that general, I mean, people can have some harms and there can be accidents and deaths due to cannabis, but it's generally not associated with overdose per se. So that's one way that it differs. But, but when you think about sort of relative danger, I, I like to remind people that um, jumping from a third story uh, building will break your legs cause uh, concussions, and can even be fatal in some circumstances. Does that mean that falling out of a third, off a third-story building is not as bad as falling off of a 20- or 30-story building? Of course. But that doesn't mean I'd recommend falling off of a three-story building either. And that's how I, I, I sometimes try to help explain that even if something may be on average less harmful, that doesn't mean it's harmless or good for you either. And, and that's an important distinction to, to be made. People rarely trade one for the other. They typically add cannabis to the use of many other substances. And you mentioned that people don't necessarily overdose from cannabis, but it doesn't mean that it's not harmless. And I guess in my, my view, I've definitely seen more negative side effects with cannabis over the years. And I think a lot of that is due to how the... I guess just the genetics of it has changed. How and how has marijuana changed over the years as far as potency, as far as how it's made, as far as how it's ingested? Well, what we've seen is a gradual increase in the relative amount of THC. That's the main psychoactive ingredient in the cannabis plant in marijuana. Um, and, and that potency has gone from an average potency of something like 3% or even a little less than that to sometimes 25, 30%. And, and it's not just the plant itself. There are also now new forms of cannabis products, including extracts, waxes, oils, that can be 80 or 90% pure THC. So the dosages of THC are just markedly higher than they used to be. And that's a, that's a major change. And maybe the, some of the reason that we are seeing complications uh, in larger numbers in recent years. And I know one of the things that this increased amount of THC can do is it can cause psychosis, specifically more in men from what I've understood from reading some of your research. Um, like, why is that? And what are, the, what are the risk factors that can influence this? It's really a good question. The relationship of, of cannabis uh, to uh, uh, psychiatric symptoms is complicated. Um, so the work that you're talking about would be how do we understand the relationship long-term of use of cannabis with the development of schizophrenia or other chronic psychotic disorders? But it's well known that people who 
uh, uh, use a high dose of cannabis products can develop panic attacks, extraordinary anxiety, and can have hallucinations and delusions. That's the classic symptoms of schizophrenia or a major psychiatric disorder. And that can happen acutely. Now, does that mean that it's going to go on and persist in the long run? Generally, no, it does not. Those can be what, what we think of as overuse symptoms. Uh, ju just like somebody that drinks way too much coffee becomes extraordinarily anxious, jittery, and can have an upset mm -hmm. stomach. Too much cannabis, too much THC can produce those anxiety symptoms and frank paranoia and psychosis. That's well known and is seen in emergency departments all across the country every day in the United States now and probably internationally, but I'm more familiar with the U.S. situation. What we've also learned, though, from some work that we've supported and conducted with colleagues out of Denmark is that as cannabis use has been increased in the Danish population, they've seen a corresponding increase in the rates of schizophrenia. And this is particularly true for young men. So younger men over the last 30 years have higher rates of psychosis that uh, uh, appears to be attributed to the increasing rates of cannabis in that population. Well, the question that you asked is a really important one. Why would uh, boys or men be particularly vulnerable to use of cannabis? Why might that make their brains uh, a move towards chronic psychosis, move towards schizophrenia? We certainly don't have a complete answer to that. And that's some of the reason that we're conducting lots more research on the impacts of cannabis that are that the National Institute on Drug Abuse is supporting. But some of the reasons might be both because men and boys are more likely to use cannabis. So they're just maybe more at risk because the rates are a little bit higher, particularly in Denmark. Uh, the second reason might be is has to do with brain structure and function of the uh, uh, of men and boys during adolescence that their brains may be a little bit more vulnerable than girls and women uh, to the effects of, of, of THC and cannabis products. I would be totally speculating, but I'm very curious about how we've recognized that some of the onset of these psychiatric serious psychiatric illnesses may relate to how the brain goes through restructuring during adolescence. And some of that restructuring and pruning is conducted by our immune system. Well, guess what? Cannabis products uh, uh, have a big impact on the immune cells in our brain and the immune cells throughout the body. The uh, uh, CB2 receptors are very prevalent in our immune system. Now, does that play a role in the onset of psychosis? I don't know. But those are sort of some of the intriguing possibilities that researchers need to help us understand and 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 continue to evaluate. You've studied a lot of um, epidemiology as it relates to a lot of this stuff as well. And have you seen that there are any kind of common themes as far as what factors are at play when men tend to develop psychosis or some of these young adults, young boys start to develop um, psychosis? Is it environment related? Is it genetics? Like, are there, have you found any, anything like that? Well, there's certainly clues that genetics play a key role in the onset of pretty much all the behavioral disorders that a psychiatrist takes care of. So genetics play a key role in who will go from using a substance to developing a full-blown substance use disorder. Genetics play a major uh, role in that trajectory. They also play a key role in the onset of of, of serious psychiatric conditions like major depressive disorder, like psychosis, schizophrenia, as we're talking about. How those interact with the use of cannabis is not well understood yet. So these are some of the cutting edge research that many of our, our colleagues are conducting right now. And then regarding epidemiology in general, like what have the studies that you've observed or, or researched on, what have they revealed about cannabis use? Some of the most important findings are just sort of the description of how many people are using the substance. Is it increasing? Is it changing? We've seen a number of really important trends. One good news is that we've actually not seen particular increases in cannabis use by the youngest people in our country. So 12, 13, 14 year olds from annual surveys out of the University of Michigan's Monitoring the Future study, we've seen either level or declining rates of cannabis use and use of most other substances in, in the early teens. 
But that's not true when you get to the late teens and young adult population. So we've seen a market increase in the last, uh, say, 10 years in the number of young adults and even older adults using uh, uh, cannabis products. So the population using cannabis is expanding markedly, and it's generally increasing. The rates are increasing starting at around 18, 19, 20, through the 20s and 30s. Those have seen the largest increases. We're also seeing the baby boomers as they age into their retirement years, uh, showing increased rates of cannabis use as well. And so, so we, we are seeing a much broader population exposed to cannabis uh, with the potential for harms at all those different ages. And then how does marijuana impact the brain differently versus kids versus adults? I mean, I think I've read somewhere that, I mean, I think during like the teenage years of kids use marijuana excessively, they're like X amount times more likely to develop some sort of psychotic disorder or psychiatric disorder later on in life. Like, um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there are multiple studies now that show that the youth that use cannabis during their teen years are much more likely to have depression, are more likely to have difficulties with achieving sort of normal milestones. So they're less likely to finish school. They're more likely to have legal problems. They're less likely to earn an income. And rates of suicidality, meaning wanting to take your own life or even taking your own life, are are, are higher among those teens years later after they start using at that early age. So that, of course, that has me as a public health official very concerned. And the recommendation is clear. Stay away from this and you'll be healthier. Right. And and now I think kids are even more confused because marijuana has be, been decriminalized, which I think has obviously some positives because you're keeping people who are have substance use disorder and people who are addicted to drugs out of jail, which I think is, in my opinion, is, is a great thing. And it's also become legal in some states. And these kids, I think, are seeing it like, well, it's legal. It's not that bad. If it's if it's legal, then it's it's then it's it's safe to use. Without getting into like policy specifically, how has the legalization and decriminalization of marijuana, how has that impacted addiction and specifically how these teenagers view it? Well, of course, that's a complicated set of questions because you're asking about the relationship of, of, of policy changes to teenage attitudes. Teenagers are part of our communities. They are absolutely aware of the changing attitudes towards, towards cannabis. Uh, they are, they, they, their perceptions of the potential harmfulness of cannabis have dropped considerably. But that what, what has been a little bit of a surprise is as they have no longer feared it as much, they no longer see it as harmful as they once did, we have not seen at least the 13, 14 year olds and 15 year olds increasing their use. But we do see that uh, 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 the increasing rates in a slightly older group. And I think that may relate to the the decreases in perceived harmfulness. Has legalization really changed how much people use in different parts of the country? The evidence is mixed on that. Um, it, It certainly is related to overall trends but can we point towards legalization in one state as showing that that state shows an increase compared to others? The complication is one of the reasons that those states legalize it is because the rates may have been higher to begin with in those regions. We also know that even when marijuana was fully illegal across the whole country, it was not that hard to obtain. So whether a product is legal or not does not completely correlate with how available it is and whether it's it's readily available to somebody who wants to use it. So that's what makes it sort of complicated to study because there's sort of, some have this naive idea of, oh, it's not legal. That means it's unavailable. And that could not be further from the truth. I think we're all aware of that when it comes to tobacco and alcohol, which are not legal for persons under age, either 21 or 18, uh, depending on the product and the location. But yet we all know 16-year-olds who drink and we all know 16 or 17-year-olds who use tobacco products despite them being uh, illegal for that group. So that, that's why I say this relationship of the legal situation to use of a product is complicated. What do you think is so alluring about marijuana and cannabis to kids given that you know, there is messaging obviously out there about the dangers of it. They're hearing it from their parents. They might hear it from some program in a school. Like, why do kids continue to do that despite the blatant uh, adverse um, 
effects from it. One of the goals of our development as human beings is to reach out beyond our comfort zone, to try new things, to experiment, to expand our horizons. This is a natural developmental tendency that we all celebrate. We are thrilled that people take risks in appropriate ways, that people challenge us in new ways. Substances feed into that same pattern of adolescent risk-taking. And so it is, it, it, it is one of the potential uh, just behaviors that are, that are uh, uh, prevalent among adolescents and that, that natural risk taking that we celebrate in so many ways, in some ways is taken advantage of by substances and substances cue into that same uh, part of our brain that develops early in adolescence before some of the judgment and longer term decision making matures. That, that, that's sort of a complicated way of describing, and I can go into it in more detail if you'd like, about how adolescents are almost uniquely uh, 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 primed for risk-taking without the, the sort of the controls and, and the behavioral uh, uh, inhibitions that we see adults able to exert. Yeah, I'd love for you to dive more into that because I have a lot of parents that come to me. I have parents who listen to the show that just can't understand why their kids continue to do something like that despite them telling them not to or despite, you know, the kids, you know, maybe being raised in a great home or whatever the case may be. Well, one thing I like to point out to people is we all do things that aren't always in our best interests. I know it's not safe to drive over the speed limit. And I will admit here on your podcast that I do drive faster than the speed limit at times. And I know that's risky. I know it puts us in, in, in danger in some ways. And yet I make that decision almost automatically or without thinking about it. We do the same with our eating behavior, with our exercise patterns. So I think it's important for adults to recognize even within themselves the way that we don't always do what we preach. We don't always practice what we preach. And adolescents will be aware of that and uh, 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 may have some of those same tendencies. But what I can point out is that we've learned a lot about brain development over these last 20 or 30 years. And some of what we've learned is that the brain develops from the back towards the front. What happens in the mid part of the brain that mature fairly early in development? Those are the reward and reinforcement centers, some of the emotional centers of our brain that develop early in adolescence. And every parent of an adolescent recognizes the emotional ability and volatility of their early teens. That is a notorious set of behaviors. That's because that part of their brain is growing faster than the rest of the brain. The front parts of our brain are where judgment, decision-making, what some have described as sort of putting the brakes on behavior. Uh, those parts of the brain develop later. Now, one practical way to think about this is that I think has been recognized by the insurance industry for many, many years is when you go to rent a car, you have a driver's license, so you are able, fully capable of driving a car, but they will either charge you more or won't rent to you if you're under age 25. And that's because there's a recognition that teenagers are more likely to have accidents because of the risk-taking and uh, uh, behavior that they may engage in. So even before we had the brain science to help us understand maturation of the brain, the insurance industry recognized that it was a risk for them and their bottom line. So uh, we saw judgment and decision-making developing after the uh, uh, full abilities to operate machinery. And in this case, even, e even the propensity to take risks starts earlier. And so with that said, what, what advice do you have for parents, or maybe you could point them to some great resources so that they can learn more, not only about marijuana and what it really is, but also like how to maybe communicate with their kids so that it can lead to that, lead to them, um, you know, maybe not using marijuana instead of like the resistance that tends to happen a lot when parents try to talk to their kids. I think parents need to be aware that even when, even when their teenagers or young adults seem to be ignoring them, seem to be discounting the messages that they provide, those messages are still sinking in. In other words, clear communications, a clear uh, uh, message of not 
liking and thinking and discouraging them from using alcohol, from using tobacco, from using cannabis, from using other substances is a very important, clear message to convey. At the same time, how do we find a way to accept our loved ones where they are? And particularly as teens develop and move beyond the, uh, 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 the household, the, the direct impact and, and rulemaking control that a parent has, of course, is diminished over time. There's a lot less you can do with an 18-year-old than with a 10-year-old. But all parents recognize that even with a 10, 12, or 14-year-old, you have limits in terms of how much uh, 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 control you have over their behavior. And so having a realistic appreciation and providing the love and nurturance that uh, uh, is so essential to everyone's development is another key ingredient here. That even when your children do something that you don't approve of, that you're worried about, expressing that concern is, is of course, very important but not withholding the love and nurturance is, is also uh, 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 very important as well. Because those strong family bonds will in the long run pay off markedly. I'm sorry that I don't have a sort of secret answer for how to keep kids safe. We don't have one. We know that even in the best families and the best circumstances with the most loving, nurturing and appropriate rule setting and boundary setting that a family can provide that they're, that they're that, that many youth will still use substances and still have serious consequences. But those techniques can have a big impact and provide a lot of safety and security for many youth. And then as, as far as um, like, like resources, let's just say a parent's listening to this and their, their kid right now is somebody who is struggling with excessive amounts of cannabis use. And they're kind of like unsure of what to do. They're, they're hearing this and they're like, all right, I got to, you know, have compassion for my kid. I got to know that they're accepted, but I also have to like hold some sort of boundaries so that they don't continue to do these behaviors. And a lot of times they try to do it on their own. I know that that's probably the wrong way to, to go about it. Like, is there any kind of websites or resources that maybe NIDA has that, um, that you might, you know, point them to if they're experiencing something like this? Well, Absolutely. I encourage you to look at the website for the National Institute on Drug Abuse for resource material for families. You can find that quite readily on our website. I also would say that a, a, an important source of information may be your own family doctor or pediatrician. These are, these are issues that almost all pediatricians are well aware of and able to address. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a lot of good material on their website as well. So I, I, I would look to the health professionals and those around you for some of this information. There's other websites uh, from federal partners, such as the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That's kind of a mouthful. But if you can remember S-A-M-H-S-A, -S -S -A, SAMHSA, uh, there's a lot of information on that agency's website as well. And we at the National Institute on Drug Abuse collaborate with our federal partners and with organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics every day to make new information available to parents, family members, and the youth themselves so that they can take better care of themselves and live healthy, productive lives. When we were talking about psychosis and marijuana use earlier, you mentioned that some of the things that marijuana can do is it can lead to hallucinogen, it can lead to hallucinations, it can lead to panic attacks, it can lead to anxiety. And yet there's this big message right now that marijuana is like the antidote or the cure for anxiety, helping you sleep better, improving your mental health. Like, why do so many people think that it does that, even though all of the evidence says quite the opposite? Well, the evidence is clear that the public finds some of these products to be beneficial. So as a physician, I, I, I want to listen to my patients say, all right, you're using this to help you sleep. What we often find though, is that it's, it's, it's a bit of a cycle here. So that as people use cannabis on a regular basis, they actually become physically dependent on it. They develop what I think of as a classic addiction. So they're using it all the time. They're organizing their life around it. They're using it despite it causing consequences. They also develop tolerance. That means they need to use more and more to get the effect they're looking for. So instead of using you know, once a day or twice a day, they'll start using multiple times a day. 
Um, uh, we also see withdrawal symptoms. That's a classic symptom of a substance use disorder. When you stop some, uh, uh, using the substance, you don't feel good. Is it a life-threatening withdrawal? No, it's not. It's not like withdrawal from alcohol or some other substances that can be extraordinarily medically serious. But it is very uncomfortable. People develop irritability, craving. They have trouble sleeping. They may have changes to their appetite. They become uh, uh, have difficulty concentrating. So these are sort of general symptoms of cannabis withdrawal that are typical within hours to days after the last use of a substance. So guess what? I stop using, I start feeling restless, anxious. I get irritable. I go use again, I feel better. Does that mean I was treating my restlessness, my anxiety with cannabis? No, it means I was treating withdrawal. And so the real answer there is, is how can we help you uh, alleviate those symptoms gently over time so that you can be abstinent and, and, and be healthy without those substances? Now, I wanna say that, the, that there may be benefits from THC and CBD and other chemicals within the plant. And this absolutely deserves evaluation because for the treatment of insomnia, for the treatment of many behavioral health conditions, we don't have good medications. We don't have good treatments. And so to the extent that there might be some ways that THC, CBD, and the other chemicals in the plant can be useful for these health conditions, uh, we're very much in favor of, of trying to figure that out. Yeah. And so what, given what you, given what you were saying a minute ago, um, it, it seems that one of the hardest things for people to remain abstinent or sober from marijuana is that withdrawal process and the, the symptoms that arise from it. You talked about helping people do the best they can to alleviate those symptoms. What are a few things that you found to be useful with patients or just in research to help people get through that uh, withdrawal process as best as they can? Well, somebody with a full-blown substance use disorder related to cannabis needs to work with a physician or other clinicians that are familiar with this, that can help guide them through it, that can help them withdraw safely. So that means uh, either reducing the amount they use slowly over time to minimize the risk of withdrawal. Sometimes medications can be used to uh, alleviate some of the withdrawal symptoms. So you might use, uh, 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 you, you know, if you're having aches and pains, we might recommend something as simple as acetaminophen. That's over-the-counter medications for common pain conditions. We might recommend uh, uh, other kinds of sleep medications for those first couple of days when you really can't sleep very well and are particularly uh, having particular difficulties. Many of us have watched people quit using tobacco products and the difficulties they have in those first few days. Now, while there are, are regular medications that can alleviate that for tobacco, we also know that if people can find a ways to be supported during that time, they will recover from those symptoms. Cannabis withdrawal resolves over time. So finding ways to support people during those days or sometimes a, a few weeks um, is essential in helping people move towards abstinence and recovery. One of the things that I think really bothers people from what I've learned when they're going through withdrawal from marijuana is these, they have like wild dreams. Um, any idea on why that occurs? I don't think we completely understand why dreams are more prominent during withdrawal, but you're not the first person that has mentioned that. It's not one of the symptoms that has been evaluated fully in most of the studies looking at withdrawal because I don't, I don't think the researchers were... Uh, 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 expecting that, and so they didn't always uh, include it in their in their questions and in their evaluations. But we certainly hear that regularly. I, I I think it's a good reminder that substances have a big impact on our sleep structure and our sleep function function. So we know that when people come off of alcohol, they also have major disturbed sleep. When people stop using uh, opioids or stimulants, there may be major disruptions to sleep. I think the prominent dreams is another symptom of how these substances, cannabis included, can have a major impact on many aspects of our brain health, including either how well we fall asleep, whether we stay asleep, and as you're describing, the kind of dreams maybe we have. We may have. Fortunately, we don't see 
uh, 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 nightmares and sleep terrors commonly being associated with uh, during withdrawal. That would have been a much more devastating kind of symptom. But vivid dreams may be quite prominent and uh, 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 and can be disturbing because of the the uh, nature of uh, of their content, and you wake up going, "What was that all about?" Um, we've all had that experience with dreams, but if you have that more frequently, that can certainly be disturbing. One of the things that I heard when I was growing up, what people would say to me to kind of, I guess, quote unquote, scare me from not smoking weed or smoking marijuana was, "It's going to destroy your brain. It's going to rot your brain, and it's going to permanently destroy your brain." Like all these things. Obviously, my, my brain, I think, has healed pretty well over the years since now being in recovery for almost 15 years. What are your thoughts on how marijuana impacts the brain um, like long term and can it um, can it heal itself? Well, the good news is that when people stop using their brain function improves really quite quickly. So we see strong evidence that while people are using cannabis products, their ability to remember things, their ability to, to learn new activities is impaired. They're not as quick, they're not as bright, they're not as good students. Um, uh, and so all those challenges that we hope to be able to do on a daily basis are impaired by use of cannabis. But there are now multiple studies that show when someone stops using they're actually their memory improves, their ability to think clearly improves fairly rapidly. We've also seen this in broad populations where when cannabis uh, was removed from a university community in the Netherlands, we actually saw the grades improve of those uh, uh, dur during that time period, which to me was a very interesting finding that, that you could have a big impact on a university when cannabis suddenly was less available in the local area. We talked about what's alluring for kids and cannabis earlier and that they're just bigger risk takers than adults. And from a broader perspective, there's a variety of reasons why people would use any kind of substance to, to, to numb pain and numb emotional pain and become addicted to something, right? And so if somebody's like looking to be in long-term recovery from something like cannabis, but they're trying to, I guess, deal with some of the problems that may have led to them using it in the first place? Is there, is there anything like things like fitness and things like community groups, things like meditation that you found to be relatively effective in, in giving them the same type of effect that cannabis was giving them? When we start getting into what's helpful to help people in recovery, there are both uh, uh, techniques that are, 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 reasonably well proven, like general substance use treatment has been shown to be effective. We see community reinforcement approaches uh, showing positive impacts, at least among youth who use cannabis. So that's a way to reinforce abstinence through support in a broader network. I think you're describing the importance of general health uh, in terms of taking care of our bodies. That's that's essential for all aspects of life. And so it may help you with cannabis use disorder and it's gonna be good for you in many other ways as well. We haven't learned as much about how uh, mindfulness, meditation, and those techniques can be specific to cannabis use disorder, but we certainly know that many people are using these and they appear to be beneficial. And the research we hope will help confirm who they help, who it doesn't seem to make much difference one way or the other. I don't see a downside in these techniques. Uh, they're inexpensive. They can be self-taught. They can be uh, uh, learned in uh, online groups or with, with many other uh, uh, supports. And so I, I don't really see any harm in them. And the potential benefits could be profound for many. Hmm. Going back to uh, excessive cannabis use and psychosis, what's the difference between like entering a, a state of psychosis and then developing like schizophrenia, like what differentiates the two things? Well, the difference is a psychotic uh, uh, condition is a description of somebody who has fixed false beliefs. That's a delusion. That's what a psychiatrist calls a delusion. And many of us see, have, have experienced that with people around us becoming excessively paranoid, afraid that people may be harming them or out to hurt them. Uh, and irrationally believing that these are happening. And that, that's what it's all about. These are, these are not normal everyday fears, but they're exaggerated way beyond what is possible or, or at all uh, 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 conceivable. 
That's the delusion part. Hallucinations are false sensory experience. So that means seeing things that aren't there, hearing voices or sounds or other perceptions that are not actually happening, that no, no one else experiences. They can also be false smells, false tastes, or false sensory experiences in terms of uh, skin crawling or a sense that there may be bugs under the skin. That's one of the most disturbing one, uh, symptoms. These are not pleasant experiences either. These are not positive false sensory experiences, but they're extremely disturbing to the people that, that have them. And that's part of what's going on with, these, uh, uh, with, with a psychotic disorder. Now, those are the symptoms. That can happen with certain medications, certain head injuries. It can happen with poisons. It can happen with substances like cannabis. Those uh, uh, are, are typical causes. A diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, is when those types of symptoms, as well as a deterioration in general functioning, happens over a long period of time. Uh, so, of course, we are very concerned when these symptoms happens, happen acutely or suddenly. But when they begin to take place over a longer period of time, the worry is that they may become permanent or be a, a, a symptom of a chronic relapsing condition. These are a psychiatric emergency when those symptoms occur. They need a full evaluation. If it's due to a head injury, you may need to have the, the uh, whatever emergency procedure uh, can be done to alleviate that. If it's due to, a, to the onset of a chronic psychotic disorder, medications are, are, are almost certainly in order to help alleviate the symptoms and improve the long-term uh, prognosis. We've seen from work supported by the National Institute on Mental Health over the last couple of decades, that early intervention for persons with psychotic disorder, like schizophrenia, can have a, 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 a potential positive impact in reducing the likelihood of complete deterioration and, and the most serious negative outcomes. So from what I've heard you say, when somebody just has a bout of a psychosis, like a shorter period of time, where they're, what's, the, what's, the, what's the period of time that's like the max before it enters schizophrenia? Well, generally, we would we would uh, make a diagnosis of schizophrenia based on symptoms and deterioration progressing over at least six months. Uh, generally, it's much longer than that. But anything that goes on more than a, a few days would be extremely worrisome in, in, in my experience as a psychiatrist and in, and in what the research would tell us. So we mostly uh, become concerned when symptoms last longer than a short period of time. And I would worry even when they only happen for a little period of time, these are miserable uh, uh, symptoms that should be avoided. Uh, and to the extent that they can be a signal of a serious health condition, whether that's the onset of, of schizophrenia or, a, or a, a, a shorter term, but serious physical illness, uh, it, it is something that requires emergency care. Yeah. And I guess what I, what I was getting at was, so I guess based on what you're saying, somebody has a a short bout of psychosis, like the, under the, the six month mark. But obviously, like you said, any bout of psychosis is, is not good and people should see a, their medical doctor and stop whatever harmful substance that they're doing at that time. But at least at that time, it gives them hope to like reverse that and let their brain kind of come back to its natural state versus somebody who goes on for years of doing this, they develop uh, a serious schizophrenia disorder. And then there might be, you know, no chance, right, of them coming back to a normal state? Well, even when somebody's had schizophrenia, many people will recover, some, will recover function. So it isn't always a deteriorating uh, uh, course. But it is, of course, ma many do experience that deteriorating long-term course. So that's why we, we want to avoid that, recognize it early, and, and, and do everything we can to prevent that, that really devastating psychiatric illness from, from, from occurring. But you're absolutely right that when the substances have caused an acute psychosis, I would hope that that's a signal that somebody needs to change their behavior and stop using the substance that's causing that. Unfortunately, a bad outcome, something bad happening to you, does not always inspire people to change their behavior. I think we've all uh, uh, witnessed people who continue to drink, continue to smoke cigarettes, and in this case, continue to use cannabis, even though it is clearly causing them serious physical or mental harm. And that's a classic hallmark of an addictive disorder. And it's 
while we're working at, at the National Institute on Drug Abuse to develop uh, uh, treatments so that we can help people turn their lives around even when they find themselves stuck in these behaviors. Would you like to see more like warnings about the risks of, of cannabis? Because obviously people are using cigarettes and they know what it can do. People are using alcohol, they know what it can do. But a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here, I mean, it's not it's not as public as the dangers of, of smoking cigarettes and using alcohol. Well, I think you're absolutely right. That making sure we get the message out about both the potential dangers and also the benefits of, of abstinence and sobriety uh, are, are messages of hope and change that can really help uh, change the dialogue. I do think it's an uphill battle as we see uh, 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 assertive marketing of cannabis uh, uh, dispensaries and uh, uh, products around the country, that that becomes something that, that me and many others are concerned about uh, as, the, as something that's moving in the opposite direction in terms of general publicity around the potential for these products to be, to pe pe people think they'll be helpful. Um, mostly they're intoxicants. They're used for people to get uh, intoxicated and, uh, but, but it's sometimes done under the rubric of a medical uh, procedure and medical process. What do you think are some of the other misconceptions around marijuana? Well, one of the misconceptions would be that it's safe during pregnancy, that it's safe uh, for uh, uh, young persons. Uh, these are things that I think we particularly want to address um, in our public health messaging. We see all too frequently uh, 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 pregnant persons using cannabis to address the nausea or discomfort of pregnancy. Uh, and yet uh, we know that uh, the uh, ca cannabinoid receptors, these are the brain, the receptors in our nervous system are developing early in fetal development. And so use of cannabis products could have long-term negative impacts on, uh, on a developing uh, uh, baby. And uh, I, I think use during pregnancy is one that I'm particularly concerned about at this time. I, I, I'd also say that the messages for teens around cannabis are clear, that uh, staying away from all substances, but particularly but cannabis included, uh, uh, particularly during teen years as the brain is undergoing such important development is a very important message. Now, how we get that across in a successful way so that we can support families and parents uh, is, is the reason that we continue to conduct prevention research and intervention research, because we have not been successful. As you all know, from the many people that use these products, we've got a long way to go. Without our interventions, though, I think the numbers would be even more startling. So I, 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 I want to congratulate the families, the community organizations, people like you that are trying to bring health messages and, and behavioral change messages out there. That's really important, uh, but we still have a lot more work to do. What are your thoughts on harm reduction, like using marijuana as a form of harm reduction? Because that's, that's a big thing that people are, are saying right now, too. Well, what I find is that I want to look at the facts uh, behind those statements because people say that, but their behavior often doesn't actually represent what I think of as harm reduction. If you truly were trading your a, a, a full-blown injection drug use behavior and you shift it to cannabis use on a regular basis and that seemed to keep you away from injecting methamphetamine or cocaine or heroin, um, I, I'd be all in favor of that. If it was a successful transition away from those uh, 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 acutely and long-term dangerous behaviors. But what we often see is that people simply add cannabis to it. And so they're saying they're trying to reduce their harms, but that isn't what we're seeing in terms of the behaviors. Now, can we use cannabis chemicals, CBD, or the plant itself in the treatment of, of addiction to opioids? That's a really important question that researchers right now at Mount Sinai in New York are investigating. Yasmin Hurd and her colleagues are looking at whether CBD, per, for example, may be useful for helping people recover from opioid use disorder. I, I hope that's successful because then we may have some new treatments, but it needs to be done in a thoughtful way uh, that's actually reducing the harms and not simply adding a new substance to an already complicated life. Yeah, I've heard that from other people as well, that that's like the, the common thing is that 
um, like logically it might make sense, right? Because you're taking, you're using a, a quote unquote less harmful substance. You're replacing a harmful substance with a less harmful substance, but I mean, addiction's addiction, right? And it's a progress, it's a progressive disease and that, right? I agree. And, and, and also you're using the word replace. And if that truly is the case, that may be a reasonable trade-off. And I don't want to discount that. That is for, for an individual, if that happens, I would se- help celebrate that. But the problem is it, it often isn't a replacement. It's often an addition. Going, I want to go, go back to the psychosis thing for just a second. And I'd love to know, like, how does recovery from marijuana or cannabis addiction differ when you've had a bout of psychosis or you've been in psychiatric care for cannabis use versus just the normal everyday person who's like, you know what, this is negatively impacting my life. It's time for me to stop. Well, when somebody has developed a a, a psychotic disorder, actually avoiding mood altering substances in cannabis becomes even more important because it can uh, it, it, it can really cause continuation of those symptoms, make them worse over time, and, and, and make the long-term outcomes even more negative. So that becomes very important. What we don't know is, is how much is the cannabis fully causing the psych, ca- causing schizophrenia versus uncovering something that might have developed later on in life anyway. I'm not sure that that matters too much because we know that the combination is bad, uh, but it could be that what it's partly doing is uncovering a latent schizophrenia. In other words, somebody who was at risk already, and then this tips the balance into schizophrenia. But as psychotic symptoms progress over time, it's very important that they be treated seriously and be taken care of as its own condition. So getting a a long-term psychiatric care and avoiding substances, avoiding cannabis will be a key part of making sure that you have the best chance to live a healthy, productive, full life. Given that your role at NIDA is to help you know, develop research and fund research for studies that look more into this, look more into these types of things, like what would you like to see more research on as it relates to cannabis? One of the studies right now that I'm most excited about is our Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. This is a very large-scale project that started with about 12,000 9- and 10-year-olds. 9- and 10-year-olds, why'd you start there? We started with that age group because that is before almost all had started using any substances. So we were able to do full evaluations of these this very large number of of youth and their families to understand their development, their functioning in school, all of their pre-existing psychiatric conditions, whether that's attention deficit disorder, whether it's difficulty with certain learning behaviors, other behavioral issues, a very full evaluation, including an examination of their brain using an MRI scan. Every year, we come back and our researchers talk to those youth to see what's happening. And every two years, they've been doing repeated brain scans. These youth are now between 14 and 16. So we are seeing the beginnings of use of some substances. And so with this study, we hope to uncover how much is it cannabis causing some of the brain changes? How much are the brain changes preceding any use of cannabis? Or might these sort of be two parallel processes going along at the same time? This is the kind of project that I think will lead to major, major discoveries and major new information out about how cannabis, tobacco, alcohol, and other substances affects brain development during this crucial phase of puberty and adolescence. So that's one of the studies I'm particularly excited about. You asked about other research needs. One that is very important right now is we're seeing cannabis shift from smoked plant product to use of high potency waxes, oils, vaping products, edibles. We know very little about how these affect uh, the brain, how these affect growth and development, how they affect the body, and we need to know more about them. This has proven difficult to study because uh, of restrictions on how, as a federal agency, we can allow you to use tax dollars, that's what these are, to study products that may come from dispensaries and the other vendors all across the country. So I can look at the individuals that use these products, but I, 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 we, we are not allowed to use our 
research funds to actually purchase and then study the materials that are sold in dispensaries all across the country. I hope that'll change so that we can learn more about the exact products that people are using every day in our country with potentially unexpected and, and very concerning outcomes. Dr. Compton, this has been awesome. I wanted to thank you so much for your time. I know you're a busy person and it means a lot that you took the time to do this. Well, it's a great pleasure to join you and I, and I appreciate you extending the message around the public health concerns around cannabis, but frankly also some of the potential benefits of the chemicals within the, chem, within the cannabis plant that might lead to medical breakthroughs as well. These are, these are complementary and sometimes contradictory, but important goals that we have at the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institutes of Health. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again for your time, Dr. Compton. And I'll be, be sure to link um, NIDA's website as well as SAMHSA's website um, in, the, in the links in the show notes of the episode. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.